Hi everybody, welcome to the fifth annual Distributed SQL Summit. I am Karthik Ranganathan, one of the co-founders and the CTO at Yugabyte DB, and thank you everybody for joining me. This year, our keynote's theme is Dream Big and Go Bigger. It's about turbocharging Postgres SQL. But, JNAI is the rage these days. No keynote and no respectable keynote can actually not have JNAI in it, so here you go. A lot of JNAI on this slide. Well, you might be thinking, yeah, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it actually does. Well, the first thing that we're announcing, we'll be announcing a number of uh, product announcements today, and the first thing that we're announcing is support for PG Vector in Yugabyte DB. It's a technical preview, and uh, you can do things like vector similarity search and store embeddings and you know, do a number of things that help Gen AI applications. So do try it out and let us know how it goes. Anyway, now that we have done our Gen AI piece, and now this is a really interesting keynote, let's go on with the rest of the things. Well, what we really meant to say was, we really love Postgres at Yugabyte DB. Again, nothing new. We've been saying it all along. We, we said it way back when, and now Postgres is in fact becoming the default database API. Every database out there is starting to adopt the Postgres API, and you know, that's because Postgres is so mature and so proven, so reliable, so feature rich. It's extensible, huge ecosystem of data products and, and, and various frameworks around it, and an unbelievably large open source community. So it has all the good things going for it. It is simply put the rage, right? So what are your dreams for Postgres? What do you wish Postgres has that it doesn't currently, or, or it can do that it currently doesn't do? And before you answer that, remember, dream big. That's the keynote theme, dream big. So when we asked a lot of people, here's what the users told us. Well, the top three things were, they wished Postgres had better connection management, built-in resilience out of the box so you don't have to deal with how to do failovers and, and flips and all of that stuff. And it could scale on demand when you need it, exactly when you need it, and scale back down when you don't need it, because it's very convenient to be able to handle bursty workloads. So these are the things that you know a lot of people are dreaming about that Postgres has. Okay, got it, we got it. So let's summarize. The big dream wish list, the dream really big wish list for Postgres is, it's the Postgres, the same Postgres you love, keep it the same, make connection management virtually pain-free, and put in built-in resilience out of the box and on-demand scale, so scale whenever you need to. So that's what we take as the, the first to-do list. Now, anything else, and remember this time, go bigger, because you are going to dream big and go even bigger. So what is it that we found? We said folks needed migrations on steroids. People simply hate the migration aspect of going from one database from to another. So if you're coming from Oracle or DB2 or, um, or a SQL Server or Sybase or Informix or whatever it is, the migrations are hard. Replication and disaster recovery is you know, still a little bit of stepping on eggshells with Postgres, so that's something that they would love to unleash. And you know, create far, like, you know, really powerful global architectures because nowadays there are users distributed all over the globe, there's regulatory compliance, there's a number of things forcing global applications. So this is the big and bigger wish list, right? So the biggest wish list, so whatever. So let's keep going forward. Let's actually see if we can make your dreams come true. Well, hint, hint, spoiler, we do make it come true, we, but you knew that already, but let's keep going. Okay, let's take the first thing. It's the same Postgres you love. Nobody wants to change their knowledge of Postgres. Nobody wants to change their app. Nobody wants to change anything but keep it the same. It's the stuff everybody loves. So this Postgres you love actually starts with extreme, complete Postgres compatibility. All right, so what is it that we are announcing? Well, the first thing we're announcing, Yugabyte DB already supports a ton of Postgres features, including all the advanced features, including things like stored procedures and triggers and server-side cursors and your PLPG SQL languages and a whole bunch of extensions and a lot, lot more. 
One of the things we are announcing today is transaction semantics that mirror what PostgreSQL does. And specifically, we recently announced support for read committed isolation. So that completes our most used set of Postgres isolation levels, serializable, repeatable read, and read committed. And not just that, we have introduced pessimistic locking with similar transaction retry semantics and internal semantics to what Postgres does, which is something that people absolutely love. Now, with our Postgres compatibility and our read committed and pessimistic locking and a whole bunch of other goodies, we are becoming so Postgres compatible that we were able to get a lot of these real world applications to seamlessly run on Postgres. I mean, if you look at the list, there's a number of common ones out there, Mastodon, GitLab, Jira, Udo, a whole bunch of others, right? Won't go down the list, but these are pretty popular applications and these are just a small number of a much larger list that we were able to get running on Yugabyte DB. Okay, some of these applications actually tend to have complex schemas. And no matter if it's Postgres compatible, it should just run. So we're not talking small toy applications, we're talking pretty complex applications with a lot of objects that are created and a lot of different types of objects. Mastodon, for example, has 422 different types of database objects that are created in the schema. But that's not all. We've actually had one application which is a financial core banking application that moved from Postgres to Yugabyte DB that had 67,000 objects. Yes, you heard it right, 67,000 objects. That's a heck of a lot of objects, but hey, it just works because the system catalog, the schema, the set of queries, the data types, they are all virtually the same. And this is done by reusing the Postgres code for the query engine of Yugabyte DB. All right, now, you know, Somebody was dreaming and suddenly in their dreams they heard all of the stuff, they were super happy. They're like, yeah, great, everything, it, it, it runs, my code is able to run, but does it really work the same way? Does the performance remain the same? Well, the, the worry that they have is, do they need to, do, does the application need to get re-architected? Is it possible to take an application that simply runs on Postgres, lift it, move it to Yugabyte DB, and just run it in Yugabyte DB? Well, all the list of applications you've seen before, well, that's what we attempted to do as well. We took the Postgres Docker image and flipped it for the Yugabyte DB Docker image, and we've been trying applications and getting them to run and making sure they run more and more similar to Postgres. But this is essentially the ask, no need to change the app. Can you lift and shift? Well, say hello to Postgres performance parity. And super, super proud of this very innovative piece of work that we've done. So. What we are announcing is the capability to do bimodal query executions. Yugabyte DB has a distributed query engine. That's the way it was built. And now it is enhanced and the Postgres SQL's local execution engine, where data is local, all of the data is local to the transaction processing, has been unlocked, unleashed, and now all of those work very predictably similar to how Postgres functions. So what, is the, what does this really mean? If you take for a second how Postgres SQL works, a single node Postgres installation, it, uh, the execution is optimized for local execution of data. All the data is assumed to be local, and therefore the access patterns are such that you can access data locally very quickly, and it ensures low latency. However, it cannot scale. It cannot be highly available. It doesn't replicate data, right? And in a distributed SQL engine like Yugabyte DB used to have, it does not do any local execution. All of the execution is assumed to be remote because your data scales. It's moved over to multiple machines. And it is built primarily with resilience and scale through distributed execution, which means it cannot always match what the local execution does with low latency because the design point was different. Here's what we've gone to. We've gone to a world where Yugabyte DB now has local execution, the local execution of Postgres, we unlocked it. And as long as the data is local and you don't need scale, we are able to deliver really low latency just like Postgres without you know, thinking about resilience, it's just built in. So low latency and built in resilience out of the box, working just like Postgres. And when you need to scale and move into the distributed execution world, you can scale just the objects you need and only the queries hitting those objects will switch transparently and seamlessly into resilience and scale mode.
which is really awesome, which answers just the question that our dreamer had, which was, do they need to lift and change the application or can they just lift and shift it? Well, this just enables you to lift and shift it. So what is the thing that's enabling this? Well, the, the first thing here is a distribution-aware cost-based optimizer. Um, we already had the Postgres cost-based optimizer. The cost-based optimizer we tweaked was partially local, partially distributed and remote. And now we're blending the two and making it intelligently switch between local access and distributed execution. This new cost-based optimizer closes the gap with Postgres when you're addressing data locally and you don't even have to know about it. It's all transparent. And it results in over 40% improvement in the query execution time. And it does a number of cool things like you know, offloading queries with pushdowns to move execution closer to data. It even optimizes some of the queries to outperform Postgres in some cases. And it minimizes the network and data movement costs in order to make all of the distributed execution optimal. And we're just getting started here. There's a lot more coming in the future, but we are super happy and super proud to announce this. Okay, don't just take my word for it. You know our demos. We like to show and we like to not just tell you stuff, but also show. So it's always a show and tell with us. So here you go. Take a look at this demo where it's all about how we are just like the Postgres you love. Take it away. Thanks, Karthik. I'm excited to be here. And let's go through the first demo of the keynote. Karthik mentioned a list of standard of the shelf apps that just work with Yugabyte DB. In this demo, we will focus on one of these apps called Mastodon. Mastodon is a well-known microblogging site that's very similar to Twitter. Since this is an open source app, its source code is available on GitHub. This is a complex app and runs seamlessly on Postgres. This app has grown massively, especially after Twitter went private. It needs to accelerate lift and shift modernization. So let's see how we can migrate this app from Postgres to Gigabyte DP. Currently, the Mastodon app is running on the RDS Postgres instance. The application config file shows that the app is connected to the Postgres database. So now, to migrate this app, let's create a Yugabyte DB cluster. This is an RF3 cluster with three nodes with 16 cores on each node. So the cluster has a total of 48 cores. This is similar to RDS Postgres using m 5 x large instance with 48 cores. Now, the Yugabyte DB cluster is up and running. Let's create a SQL client connection to the Yugabyte DB cluster and then create a database named Mastodon in this cluster. Once we connect to the Mastodon database, we can see there are no tables created in this database yet. Let's now create a Mastodon schema. For this, we have the PG dump file from Postgres and let's apply it to the Yugabyte cluster. It's now creating all the relations. I have created the master and app setup as well using docker and nginx the domain name for this app will be master.yb the app needs to have a database host and port so let's provide the yugabyte database host and port the app now points to the yugabyte database now let's check if our master and app is running on master.yb domain excellent you can see the app is up and running let's also check the yugabyte cluster here we can see all the tables and indexes are created now. The local timeline is empty, so let's publish a few tweets to get the load running. We are using a modern workload generator called Locust. It simulates a large number of simultaneous users. So let's generate tweets from 100 concurrent users with a spawn rate of 10. This is awesome. The app is running fine on the Yugabyte database. Now, let's compare the performance of these two apps. On the top, we have the stats from the Mastodon Postgres app. And on the bottom, we have the Mastodon Yugabyte app. Let's look at the average latency stat. You can see better average latency number in the case of Mastodon running on Yugabyte DB. But latency is just one aspect of performance. Let's see how this app is doing on other perf aspects and how it's performing on Yugabyte DB versus Postgres. You can look at the request per second or RPS graph. Also, look at the response time graph. This graph captures both the median response time as well as the 90 percentile. With Postgres, the median response time is 690 and the 90 percentile is 800 milliseconds. And the same graph with Yugabyte DB, 
the median response time is 60 and the 95th percentile is 700 milliseconds. So with gigabyte DB, the response time of the app is lower as compared to the same app running on Postgres. All right, so we showed an app that was running on a single node Postgres instance and migrated it to a modern, scalable and resilient platform without facing any performance issues that would impact customer experiences. It was seamless, just like Postgres, and we can perform such a migration for a broad set of different applications. Back to you, Karthi. Thank you, Yogesh, for that wonderful demo. Uh, it was pretty impressive getting a real-world application like Mastodon, a complex application with a number of different types of uh, database objects to lift and shift into Yugabyte DB, and not just that, to actually run with good performance parity as well. And we all know how important that is, given all the stuff that's going on around Twitter or, oh, wait a minute, now it's X and you know, you know, you know, whatever. So it's really good to have an open source alternative to that as well. So great, let's keep going. Okay, so the first dream is a checkbox. Let's go to the second one. The second dream is around pain-free connection management. All right, so what's going on here? Everyone's afraid of dealing with PostgreSQL connections. If the scale hits you, if you need high-performance connections, it's always difficult. Okay, let's change that. Let's actually you know, go way beyond and say, this is about dreaming big. Let's make you fall in love with Postgres connections. Here's why you'll love connections, and do remember these two numbers, 20 and five. This is why you will love Postgres connections. We'll come back to that in a second, but do keep that in mind. Okay, the thing that we're announcing is really pain-free connection management. And the way we're doing it is with built-in connection pooling in order to sustain a high throughput in terms of your applications. No need to keep that sustained. Even when you have huge spikes in terms of the number of connections from the application to the database and you know, ensure high performance connections, okay? And Back to the numbers. So this is why you will love it. The 20 is Yugabyte DB on a node for node basis is able to support 20 times faster connections than Postgres SQL and five times more connections per node than Postgres SQL. So once again, apples to apples set up, same type of nodes. We're able to do way better on the connection management story and this also helps you keep your throughput and without having to take an application hit in terms of your throughput while you have connection spikes. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, sounds like a whole bunch is too good to be true. If it's too good to be true, it may not be true, yada, yada. Well, don't take my word for it. Take a look at the demo and we'll, you'll be able to see exactly what it is we're talking about. It's our new connection management. is completely revamped architecture. Again, a lot of innovation, a lot of depth went into this and a lot of hard, people's hard work. And so we're super happy and super proud to show you all of those three results in this demo. Take it away. Thank you, Karthik. We've got a great demo to showcase our new native connection manager, which is a game changer. We're going to show you how Yugabyte greatly outperforms standard Postgres on measures for connection establishment and scaling with no impact on the throughput of workloads. Let's take a closer look at the numbers and test setup we've used. All our tests were run on identical hardware for Yugabyte and Postgres. We used 16 vCPU machines with 64 GB of RAM in the AWS cloud. As Karthik mentioned, our tests for connection initialization show that Yugabyte with connection management enabled consistently performs at least five times faster than Postgres. This graph shows how Yugabyte quickly establishes thousands of connections while Postgres on RDS lags behind, especially at higher connection numbers. Note that faster and thereby lower initialization times are better. Yugabyte is at least five times faster than Postgres when starting up 250 connections, and it's 20 times faster at spinning up a batch of 6,000 connections. Now that we set the stage, let's look at how Yugabyte can quickly scale to handle increased loads on databases with our new connection manager. We'll use the well-known Postgres performance benchmark, Sysbench, with a wrapper script for this. We will simulate multiple instances of an app like Mastodon, directly connecting to Yugabyte and running workloads. Let's get started. First, we'll try Postgres with 5,000 initial connections. Once the first set of connections is successfully established, We'll attempt to add new batches of 6,000 connections each. 
Here, we see the attempts to start new connections to the database failed when there are 5,000 existing connections. We leave the first batch of connections active and running. Let's kick off the same experiment with 6,000 initial connections hitting Yugabyte. We're going to ramp up connections to the Yugabyte database using separate instances of the app once the initial tranche of connections has spun up. You'll see that Yugabyte starts to effortlessly scale up the number of concurrent active connections as we add more instances of the app. And there we go. The workloads have completed successfully with no impact on throughput. Let's check back in on Postgres. The run of the first instance of the app has finally completed. As seen earlier, attempts to start new connections with this instance running failed. With this demonstration, we've shown how Yugabai can easily scale up to about 24,000 concurrent connections with no issues. The results of our extensive testing show that Postgres stops out at about 6,000 connections before complete connection failure, and also takes longer to scale up to those 6,000 connections. Yugabyte, running on identical hardware, scales up faster, higher numbers of concurrent connections, five times as many. And finally, we ensure that Yugabyte's connection pooling capabilities are ready for real-world scenarios. We've confirmed that there is no impact on the throughput of workloads even with extremely high numbers of connections to the database. This graph shows the results of our TPS benchmark tests with increasingly higher numbers of connections. And there you have it. An application such as Mastodon can grow and scale up with Yugabyte's Connection Manager to handle large numbers of connections while offering a consistent connectivity experience for all users. If you're interested in learning more about connection management in Yugabyte DB and our benchmark tests, Please take a look at Yugabyte's documentation pages. I'll turn it back to you, Karthik. Thank you so much, Nandita, for that demo. That was fantastic. Um, how did we achieve this? Well, here's how we did it. At a high level, we took a connection pooler from the Postgres ecosystem, Odyssey, and built it directly natively into the database. The Odyssey folks um, like that had built like a multi-threaded connection pooler out of Yandex, well, they'd already done a great job in ensuring high performance, high throughput, et cetera. Now, what is the real innovation that we did here? Well, a few things. Firstly, you have to worry whenever you set up an external connection pooler about sticky or pinned connections. This means you could have set some, some session variables, you could have uh, uh, like uh, server-side cursors or temp tables or a number of things that force you not to route connections. Well, as a part of the database, this component can transparently look into the database to figure out if a session needs to be sticky or can be pooled, right? Which is, which is really simplifies the whole application architecture for the end user. Now, the second cool thing we did, everybody who has set up a connection pooler knows that you need to worry about how to authenticate the connection pooler with the database. Well, with pass-through authentication, you don't have to worry about that. And a specific pain point is if you're using LDAP or some such uh, single sign-on system in order to authenticate, well, you'll have to figure out how to do that for your connection pooler, and the short answer is you can't. So all of that goes away and it just becomes transparent. And a number of other things, so uh, enabling uh, connection pooling across users and databases, so multiple users can share connection pools for a database. Um, ability to set quality of service by setting min and max number of physical connections, so a number of cool things. Once again, read up if you want to learn more, but you know this, we hope, will really make you fall in love with connections again. All right, so that was the second dream, right, that we've realized. Now, the third one, built-in resilience and on-demand scale. Those of you familiar with Yugabyte DB should know this old song. This is our original strength. This is our core purpose. This is the reason why we, all, we started it. This is the reason why Yugabyte DB even exists. Resilience out of the box. But what's new? With Postgres parity, you can scale when you need it instead of having to scale ahead of time. So that really changes the game for a lot of people that want to move applications and grow with the application when it grows, if it grows. So. Uh, some of the things, like again, resilience and scale are no strangers to us. So here's one of the things in terms of resilience in action. Well, we've actually seen in production, in the real world, a four-day outage in a, in a cloud provider's region because of a power outage. And you know, the application running on it, the customer application running on it, which was a business-critical application, did not skip a beat. 
Similarly, we've seen a bunch of different cloud zone outages, far easier than a region outage. However, they're still hard to, with demanding applications running on top that we're able to automatically continue running. We've seen a lot of node failures, and that doesn't even make the bar for actual news headlines. And we have seen hundreds and hundreds of software upgrades, AMI refreshes, security patches, changing instance types, et cetera, et cetera. When you talk about scale, well, there's a whole bunch of scale in, in like that we have seen in action too, scalability, very high scale. So we've seen applications that have done over 2 million operations per second. Yes, that's right, that's per second, 2 million operations on the database. We have clusters that have multiple petabytes of data in production, and this is online data. This is data that is transactional and operational in nature. We have over, we have clusters with, which are almost 200 nodes in a single cluster, and we have applications that are serving in five regions across three continents, and that's one logical database. So, a lot of interesting scale aspects, and you know, once again, if you need it, you know, you go by DB, if you need the scale, if you need the resilience, well, you go by DB can do a really good job of getting you where you want to go. Once again, let's take a look at the demo to see how this works in action. Hey folks, you've seen Mastodon Excel on Yugabyte DB, leveraging the cost-based optimizer, advanced connection pooling, and more. But when faced with the unpredictable, just how resilient and scalable is it? Can it withstand various cloud outages and scale seamlessly when the user traffic surges? Let's dive in and discover. As of now, Mastodon runs on the upgraded Yugabyte DB configuration. The service uses a multi-node cluster across three availability zones in the United States West region. What if we simulate a zone level outage by shutting down the node in the 2B zone and see how the app responds? First, let's put Mastodon under heavy load by starting the workload simulator. You can see users continually sending posts and sharing pictures on the social network. Next, head into the AWS console where the virtual machines with Yugabyte DB nodes are running. As planned, let's simulate a zone level outage by terminating the VM in the US West 2B zone. The VM stops quickly. Quite easy to disrupt, isn't it? Jumping back to the Yugabyte DB user interface to confirm that one of the nodes is down. Yep, it's the node from the US West 2B zone. However, this outage had a negligible impact on the cluster operations. You can see a minor drop in operations per second and a brief latency spike. Both lasted for a few seconds, while the cluster was selecting new tablet leaders and rerouting requests. What about the application layer? Has Mastodon even detected the outage? As you can see, users continue to share posts and pictures, and there wasn't a single request failure. Double checking with the charts, we see the same story. Every request succeeded as if no outage occurred at all. It's remarkable. Now Mastodon is ready to weather any storm in the cloud, be it a zone level or a regional incident. All right, friends, let's set outages aside and focus on scalability. What happens if user signups on Mastodon skyrocket and there is a surge in application requests? That's precisely what's happening with our Mastodon server right now. Many more users have signed up for the network and the infrastructure can no longer keep up with the application requests. How do we address this bottleneck? It's simple. Let's go ahead and scale out our Yugabyte DB cluster by provisioning an additional virtual machine with a new database node. The new node joins the cluster shortly and is ready to handle the user traffic. Take a look at the operations per second metric. It's fully restored and set for new heights. Job done. Now Mastodon is ready to withstand various outages and scale on demand when necessary. Thank you, Dennis, so much for that wonderful demo. That was really, really good to see. Once again, folks, um, resilience and scale are our core strengths. That's something that we've been focusing on for multiple years now. And uh, you know, as, as we've talked about before, we've seen a lot of this in, product, in, in production use cases at, at pretty large scale as well. Okay, so that's dream number three realized as well. Let's go to dream number four. How can we get you migrating? Well, I love migrations is not a very famous saying because no one ever said it and that's because nobody loves migrations. In fact, I hate migrations, said everybody all the time, right? Because the act of migrations are painful. If you haven't tried one, I don't recommend you try it unless you really wanna have pain. So that's what our dreamer says here too. It's painful. 
how do I migrate thousands of applications to Yugabyte DB? Because there is a lot of applications that need to move and that need cloud native properties, that need availability, that need scalability, and a lot of other things. So here's our announcement on this side. We are announcing the ability to plan and live migrate with Voyager. The idea is to allow people to do uh, assessments across a portfolio of databases. So you can quickly figure out which migrations are easy, which migrations are hard. You can kind of set up your schedule of what it will take to migrate. And you can actually perform you know, the schema migration and then the data migration. And one of the things we're announcing in the data migration is the ability to live migrate data, so live update. So any update to your source database automatically gets replicated to Yugabyte DB as well. And uh, this helps you really minimize the downtime because you can shadow test your application and then cut over really quickly and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so here's what the assessment utility does. Like it, there's a screenshot here, but you know, once again, it, we, we, it's never a, uh, you know, it's always a show, don't tell, show and tell. It's never a, you know, just tell. So you'll be able to see this in action. But anyway, you can assess a portfolio of databases. There are three databases shown to the right. And um, you know, uh, remember, we did some of the migrations we talked about earlier with Mastodon. We actually did that with Voyager. There's a couple of other uh, applications. We're actually going to pick up another uh, reasonably complex real application, and we're going to move that over to, to Yugabyte DB from Oracle in, this de in, in an upcoming demo. Uh, well, the, but the tool also allows you to identify the complexity of the, each migration. You can use a built-in workflow to simplify your migration. It guides you through the different steps of migrating schema, um, you know, and, and changing, making any changes, or pointing you at where changes or verification is required, and you know, actually moving the data over and helping with cutover. Uh, one of the other unique things about our data migration capability, a couple of things that we've added. We do have support for live migration, like I said, which means all the updates to the source database get reflected on the destination database. And you can cut over with a sequence of steps, which helps you stop your updates, fail over to the destination database, you go by DB and, you know, and, and continue. But it's not just that. We also have the ability for you to set up a fail back environment so you can you can set up another database for where you replicate from Yugabyte DB to this destination database through the same migration engine, through Voyager, so that you're now updating this fail, failover or fail back, fail safe environment, which is your old environment, so that if something goes wrong after you cut over, you can fall back to this old system that you had and repeat the whole process quite painlessly, right? And so this takes the boredom and tedium away from migration. So the hope is all of this um, really makes migrations simpler. But, you know, don't take my word for it. Let's take a look at it in a demo. Thanks, Karthik. Yugabyte DB Voyager expands its capabilities. Number one is assess portfolio of databases. It's a useful feature that helps with getting a sense for the complexity of the migration up front, so you can plan for time, the timing, and resources accordingly. Number two is a big feature, live migration. I'll be using a demo application called TradeX running on Oracle to demonstrate live migration from Oracle to Yugabyte DB. Regarding the demo setup, TradeX application is using Oracle. That's the initial state. And the desired state is for it to use Yugabyte DB for which we'll be doing a live migration. So live migration would mean uh, that the app is taking end user traffic business as usual while migration is happening behind the scenes with no impact to the end users or the business application. The key phases of live migration are as follows. Prepare your source DB, target Gigabyte DB, and have Voyager installed on a machine. Migrate schema. In this step, Voyager would export the schema from Oracle and translate it to Postgres compatible syntax that Gigabyte DB would accept. You would have the opportunity to look at the assessment and uh, make necessary modifications as needed before the schema gets applied to Yugabyte DB. Migrate data. In this step, a snapshot of data from Oracle is first exported and bulk imported into Yugabyte DB. Following that, change data from Oracle is continuously captured and continuously applied to the target Yugabyte DB. Cutover is a step where Voyager would finish draining, as in finish applying change data to Yugabyte DB. And at this point, the application can start using Yugabyte DB as its backend transactional database instead of Oracle. During the course of this demo, I'll be using three interfaces, a demo application called TradeX, Voyager's CLI, 
and the database UI. So switching screens to bring up the demo. All right, here is a Tradex demo application. User can browse and pick stocks to buy or sell from that list. Some relevant info about the stock the user just picked, then the user can proceed to uh, enter you know, how much of our stocks they want to buy, enter an amount. Um, so you will be able to buy you know, that stock for that desired sum of money. And then here's the database UI. You're seeing a migration uh, that has perhaps completed a while ago. So let's ignore that. I had just started the Tradex migration. So let's refresh the screen to see if the UI picks it up. Yes, it just did. So you see Tradex and it's in progress. So we the first migrate schema happens once um, the DDLs are converted to um, Yugabyte or Postgres compatible syntax. We can fire uh, the analyze schema command on Voyager CLI, and then we can come and see what happened to it. Um, so we do see an error. So it looks like there is a particular function, JSON array AGG. It is not compatible with Postgres. So um, it should be simple. We can, um, you know, there should be uh, a suggestion. There is a suggestion here that we can go with uh, something equivalent. So it, the suggestion made here is JSON AGG. And you can also see that the migration complexity is rated as easy, perhaps because there are very few tables and just one error. So therefore Voyager thinks it's uh, the complexity level is easy over here. So we could do that and then we could start with, um, you know, then we proceed with uh, export or the, or the migrate data phase where, um, you know, once the schema is migrated, you can refresh the UI to see um, the status and the percentage completion. Following that, you know, once the snapshot is imported, you would see that, you know, total um, imported events is zero. Perhaps that is because there is no live data or change data. Uh, that's coming from the Oracle database. So let's go and you know simulate some transactions on the back end. And once you see that you know there are about 4,998 transactions, you would see on the right side, those get converted to events because that is change data and that gets important. So now back to the UI, you know, let's now simulate a transaction through the UI um, and see if that also gets migrated over to Yugabyte DB. So we did the transaction. Let's go back to the CLI. We should see the count increment by one over here on Oracle side and on the imported events. Also the count, yes, it just went up by one. You can see that even the transaction through the UI made it to um, Yugabyte DB. So therefore at this time it is safe. We can do a cutover and have the app point to Yugabyte DB as it's a transactional database instead of Oracle. Thanks. And back to you, Karthik. Thank you, Prasad, for that wonderful demo. It was indeed really, really nice. The, the tools looked great. The, the, the steps looked very intuitive and simple. So, you know, you already know you love connections in Postgres now. Uh, this will hopefully will make you love migrations as well. So, you know, what I recommend now is just like somebody said, but nobody said before, I, I love migrations. You can actually say you love migrations, you know, and it's hopefully addictive and you do a few of these yourself. So do give it a try. It's not so bad. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is replication and DR, right? And uh, this is another core pain point in Postgres, right? And so what we're announcing here is two things, right? And uh, with, with Postgres, the replication throughput and the RPO, that's one, one general issue, and how do you do DR is another. But there are two things that we're announcing. The first one is transactional replication capability, right? So you have a source, you go by DB cluster. You have a destination, you go by DB cluster. Each of these clusters has multiple nodes. The first thing that, you have to, that happens is you have a multi-node to multi-node high throughput X cluster replication. So it's not one node to one node, it's many nodes to many nodes. That means you get a really, really fat pipe in order to replicate your data. And what is the use of this? This means that your replication lag is going to be low and you lose very little data when you fail over, right? And so that's the minimizing the RPO. But it's not just that. We have introduced transactional semantics so you can actually see your transactions come on the other side in order, in order to maintain referential integrity on the replica. This means that this behaves exactly like a traditional database. And why are we excited about this? Like, it is unique. The reason is because we are the first database, and I think I can legitimately say that, 
uh, without it sounding like too much of a boast. We're the first database where the source database, where the source and the target database, the replica, are both synchronous, distributed, replicated, and the data between these two clusters is asynchronously replicated. So we are mixing synchronous and asynchronous replication in order to get superior characteristics. Async replication inside a region gives you virtually no data loss and very quick failover times. Async replication across regions gives you very high performance for your application with a very low amount of data loss because of our parallel throughput replication. So it's, we're kind of bringing the best of all worlds together, the best of the art of possible in cloud native architectures, public or private cloud. Right, and, and uh, some of the other specific things we've done, just like you expect in a traditional relational database, the replica has transactional consistency at all times, and because our throughput is really good, you'll be able to minimize your replication lag and thereby your RPO or your total data loss on a failover, unplanned failover event. Um, in fact, this high throughput replication in practice where we've observed it, if you have a cluster in the east coast of US and the west coast of US, which are about 50, 60, or 70 milliseconds apart network distance wise, we're able to maintain a lag much less than one second, even for pretty demanding workloads, which is, which is really, really cool. And, and we're able to maintain that through you know, bursts and peaks and you know, throughput spikes and so on. So that really brings the low RPO that uh, into effect in order to you know, protect your data. Okay, so here's the second thing that we're announcing. This is not yet out, it's coming soon. Do reach out to us if you're interested, but it's a completely radically simplified disaster recovery workflow. So you can do a number of things now with just an API or a click of a button, things like a an unplanned failover or like, you know, suppose your source database, your primary fails or your primary data center completely fails. You can promote your replica with just a simple, you know, a API or a button click. Um, but even more than that, you may have to show for regulatory or compliance or even for a fire drill purpose, you may want to do periodic planned failover. So you want to switch your uh, database from your primary to your replica every so often just to test it out to make sure everything is working. And we are adding native support for that. You can do that through an API or a click of a button as well. So let's take a look at all of this. Let's take a look at this workflow where you do the planned and unplanned failovers. So let's dive right in. Thanks, Karthik. For our first solution, DR orchestration, I'm super excited to share with you an early look at our upcoming built-in and simplified workflow to make configuring and testing your DR strategy incredibly easy. Let's jump in. So here's our database cluster in Oregon. It's for the same TradeX app that we saw in an earlier demo. We're going to set up replication to a new cluster in Virginia and then conduct a failover. Here we choose our Virginia cluster as our DR replica. Then let's choose to replicate the TradeX database. We need to next set up bootstrapping, which is the process of seeding an initial copy of the database over to our target cluster in Virginia. Now we do want an alert if our lag between the two clusters exceeds one second because we don't want to lose more than one second of data in case of a total failure. The DR stream is in progress being set up. The database continues running. There is no downtime, but some operator actions such as config changes and version upgrades, those are disallowed. And voila, we're done. Replication is now active. We are now replicating data from the DR primary. Meanwhile, the DR replica is receiving data and is indeed able to handle database reads. While everything's going great, let's fast forward a month or two and bam, there's an emergency. Users, the CIO, everyone is in crisis. We see this error message in the DR stream and we even learn from elsewhere that Oregon itself is down. So it's a big uh, company decision, really. We as a team decide we need to fail over now. And this is not a graceful failover. That was the orange. This is a immediate failover 
from that action menu uh, that will, in fact, orphan some data on the organ cluster. But we need to do that to get our app running again. We trigger the failover, and behind the scenes, we marked that organ universe as failed. We've promoted also behind the scenes the Virginia cluster to be the new DR primary, and we now allow reads and writes. As a result, our app can recover, resume, and we've achieved business continuity. Well, that went by really fast. With a few mouse clicks, we failed over, and we are working to make it that simple in both our UI and the API. Easy and integrated DR orchestration with async replication powered by Yugabyte DB X cluster. That's our new DR solution. Passing it back to you, Karthik. Thank you, Yushan. That was truly fantastic. And you know, I know of many, many people who have said, especially the, the, the planned failover piece where this fire drill has to be run almost every month is actually quite tedious and taxing on people. And once again, it's not fun. And what we really hope is, you know, this has really made it fun and simple and easy to do. So that takes care of another of the dreams. Now let's go to the last one, last but not the least, about far-reaching global architectures. Well, it's not always about just be big in terms of a database. It's also global. It's about how many regions you can reach. And there's a number of different region, reasons, reasons why you would need to go global. It could be because you want extreme resilience. You want your data dispersed far enough away so any one failure doesn't affect you. It could be for purposes of regulatory compliance because a lot of countries are starting to adopt the posture of critical data, personal data generated by the citizens of that country, by the residents of that country actually has to stay in the country and you know, so on and so forth. There's a lot of applications which have global users now, a user base that's truly multinational and they want to serve that, those users with low latency and so on and so forth. So lots of reasons to go global and lots of opportunity to go, go global with a number of different data centers and cloud providers across the globe. Now, if you look at it, like um, there's actually a whole thought process of how you can design an application uh, to make it a global application and what are the characteristics that you want it to achieve. And when you boil it all down, it comes down to a number of, number of these types of design patterns. Well, Yugabyte DB is able to support the following eight design patterns, right? Now, what's interesting is that only two of these patterns are really usually done with relational databases. Those are the two that are standardly done. And a third one, read replicas, can be achieved, although with a lot of caveats and difficulty, right? So three of these can be achieved. Two of these are stock, most often done. And uh, if you look at what a globally dispersed database like Yugabyte DB can do, it can get you to deploy a lot more of these design patterns. Now, there's a, that four is a lot of design patterns to talk about in the short time we have. So here's what we'll do. We'll actually pick one of these actual application patterns. It's called latency optimized geopartitioning. Well, the idea is we will take our TradeX application, which if you guys remember, we actually migrated from Oracle to Postgres just some time ago. And uh, we've decided we're going to go global with it. We already have DR set up with X cluster, no problem. Now our ask is we want to make sure that we want users in the East Coast and the West Coast of the US to have low latency while being able to survive a region failure, right? And giving us low latency. Well, we can have it all right now with the, the, the global application capabilities. So instead of me explaining, why don't you guys take a look? Thanks, Carton. Let's see what you described in action. Our trading app has really taken off, and the transaction volume has grown exponentially. It's become a mission-critical app for our business. As a result of this, we have now deployed our database as a single stretch cluster across four regions. We've also configured preferred locations for the database data. That's to achieve two goals. One, West Coast users will access their data on the West Coast, and two, East Coast users will access their data on the East Coast. With this setup, which we call our latency-optimized geopartitioning deployment pattern, 
we expect to achieve the magic combination of both great performance under normal operations and resilience with continuous availability and no data loss during the regional failure. Let's measure the actual latencies in these situations and see if they meet our expectations. On the left window, you can see our West Coast user. On the right window, you can see our East Coast user. All four regions are healthy. Let's make some trades. Our West Coast user loves Google, so let's buy some Google stock. We enter the trade information, and the West Coast user sees 23 milliseconds of latency for the database update operation. Our East Coast user is a big fan of AI and NVIDIA. We enter his trade information. He also sees, quite coincidentally, 23 milliseconds of latency. Now, let's cause some mayhem. Let's trigger a total failure of the database node in the Oregon region. This is a hard failure. Now let's check on our customers who are conducting yet more trades. Our East Coast user still likes NVIDIA. They want to buy even more shares this time. By the way, did you notice that the app is still running, as is the underlying database, despite the outage? Importantly, they're still able to make trades, and this is fantastic. Due to the outage in California, we do expect to see some increased latency for their trade order. That's because the East Coast database is now taking on additional load from the West Coast users. We can see that the latency has increased just slightly to 35 milliseconds. Let's see the impact on our West Coast user. The outage is near them. Importantly, the app is still running with no visible impact. They can buy even more shares of Google, and they can still trade. Despite the regional failure that has taken down part of the database cluster, the Yugabyte DB database is still responsive. This is an important point. Yugabyte DB offers continuous availability in the face of a regional outage or failure. If any single region fails, the database survives, the app survives, and most importantly, client transactions continue to succeed. We see that the latency has increased to 117 milliseconds because every write operation is now hitting both coasts. It's not a surprise. This is a reasonable trade-off. Every enterprise will choose uptime and zero data loss, even if they have to give up a little bit of performance. To summarize, we've shown something that Yugabyte DB leads the industry in offering, the unique combination of great performance under normal operations and continuous availability with zero data loss for transactionally safe and up-to-date reads and writes even after a total region or data zone disaster. All of this happens seamlessly with no add-on solutions and full automation. We're dreaming big and we're going bigger. Thank you, Charlotte, for that wonderful demo, truly informative and truly remarkable how such a complex architecture with such complex end goals can be achieved so simply. Okay, so that brings us to all our dreams, but here's a bonus one. One of the things that we are announcing uh, today is also a very simplified open source experience and it's going generally available. It is our Yugabyte D uh, tool in order to deploy and operate Yugabyte D clusters. And you can deploy clusters of any size in minutes in no time at all. And these can be global clusters. These can be a variety of different deployments. In fact, you could do all of the demos that we showed here and more with this tool in no time at all. So if you have a spare machine lying around, do give it a shot and let us know how you, how you like it. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the wish list. And you know, some dreams do come true. Even if it's a lot of items in that dream, they all do come true. So the wish list is something you can try today. And you can try it in Yugabyte DB 2.19, which is what we're really announcing the release of, and Voyager 1.5. So enjoy folks. Try it, give us, a, give us a holler and let us know how you liked it. If you need some other features, if something is interesting, some other cool enhancements in your mind, do let us know, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can learn more about everything we've talked about and more, there's always more in the releases in, uh, in the URL shown on the screen as well as on our documentation. So do go there, take a look at it. Um, and uh, enjoy your distributed SQL summit. The, the, like there's a lot of informative talks, a lot of interesting things, a lot of workshops. So do take a look. Uh, here are some of them that I would recommend you guys check out. There's a 
uh, a live workshop on building custom extensions, migrating from MySQL, geo-distributed applications. There are some really interesting core sessions around streaming data integration or internals of transactions like FastPath versus Multishard. Multi we have a number of industry experts and external speakers, so do check out the agenda. But we have Fiserv's journey to distributed SQL. Very interesting to see how they made the leap. Um, the open source tipping point, like what are we doing with open source? Like where is open source in general? Is generally about the state of open source. There's a number of others. I remember one where it's about how do you use Yugabyte D, the tool we just talked about, in order to do a number of other things. There's a ton of other talks, so do enjoy yourself. This is meant to be an informational, educational, um, event where people transfer information, talk to each other about their experiences, ask questions. So once again, thank you for joining me. Enjoy. <laughs>